from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And Mike's side today, K-State's Romulo Lolato. During our first half hour, he'll offer his overview of the state of the Kansas winter wheat crop at present. Coming out of the record cold weather in February and now with beneficial moisture across the state, Romulo also discusses two K-State informational resources available to you wheat growers right now. The regular reports on the first hollow stem stage of wheat development, important for grazing purposes, and a new wheat growth stage page on K-State's Mesonet website. And further ahead, K-State's Charlie Lee with a look at a new study of repellent products for dealing with nuisance bird activity. All that and more straight ahead on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You are listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in on this Tuesday. Well, during the first part of today's program, it's all about wheat in Kansas. Updates on the status of the crop, as well as some other associated topics. Aboard with us once more is Romulo Lulato, Wheat Production Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. What we'll get into later, Romulo, the first hollow stem as an indicator of when to take cattle off of wheat pasture. And we'll talk of a new tool that K-State has put out, and you've contributed to this, called the Wheat Growth Stage page on the Mesonet website. All of that later. Let's get your impressions of where we are with the winter wheat crop in Kansas currently. Rains recently have truly improved that situation, have they not? Hi, Eric. Yes, definitely they have. So whenever we think of the Kansas wheat crop this year, uh, I can say that it has been uh, already kind of like a roller coaster, even though we're just in the beginning of the season, right? And the reason I say that is because for those early planted crops back in September, they were actually looking quite good during the fall. They had enough rainfall to come up, and, and so they were looking quite good. And then everything that was planted later, October and into early November, only really emerged later in November. So we had two very different crops going into the winter, right? So after that, let's think back in mid-February as we are into this roller coaster story here. And there in February, we had kind of like a record low temperatures around the state. The air temperatures, they reached as low as like a negative 29 Fahrenheit in parts of north central and northwest Kansas. So at that point in time, we were really concerned. What are those cold temperatures going to do to the wheat crop? Especially that wheat crop that never really emerged until uh, November. And so it had less tillers out there, had a less developed rooting system as well. And so it was less prepared to handle those cold temperatures. Well, back then, in mid-February, we looked at at a few of the factors that can affect the winter survival uh, or the likelihood of winter queue. Of course, one of them being air temperatures. We noted that from the air temperature perspective, definitely it had reached levels that could lead to some winter queue. We were overall dry around the state, which can actually enhance the potential for a winter queue. And there was a relatively limited snow depth. Right, Those very cold temperatures, they came with just one or two inches of snow compared to our neighbors in north Nebraska or south Oklahoma. They got 10 to 20 inches, depending where in the state. So we were less fortunate in that. So all of those factors, they were uh, kind of concerning. Very cold air temperatures, uh, relatively a dry profile, especially in the topsoil, and a very shallow snow depth. But there was one promising thing, which was actually the soil temperatures, right? They never really reached single digits around the state. Uh, whenever we look at the soil temperature at that crown level, which is really what matters whenever we think of winter kill, or one of the things that matters when we think of winter kill, it got to mid-teens, you know, 15, 14, sometimes even as low as 12, which is kind of like borderline that can start causing some damage there in the middle of the winter. 
But not having seen any single-digit temperatures, we were cautiously optimistic with the potential for surviving those cold spells. And now, about a month later, we had, as you mentioned, a considerable amount of rainfall, parts of the state getting up to four, north of four inches of precipitation in a much-needed area, parts of northwest Kansas, north-central Kansas, really the entire kind of wheat-growing region getting anywhere there from an inch to to four inches of rainfall and still more rainfall coming down this week. So this rainfall was definitely life-saving there for several different perspectives, right? First, to give the crop a chance to bounce back from the winter, just to give it a chance to green up and to have some moisture there so it can actually take on that spring development, which is really going to be related to our grain yield potential. But second... We had several growers who were already out and putting fertilizer, taking advantage that there was rain on the forecast and definitely that nitrogen, that sulfur fertilizer that was put out before the rain would have been incorporated and would be at the root zone now, which is when the crop needs, right? Think about it. As we leave the winter, go into the spring, uh, the crop switches that gear and goes uh, from vegetative to reproductive stage. So right now, it starts to develop that small, tiny head in the crown. Right now, it's going to be in the crown, and the stem is going to start to elongate. And having that available nitrogen, having that available sulfur in the root zone now is crucial to make sure that the potential number of kernels in each one of those tiny heads is sustained. That we have, well, first, that we can have several teethers out there, and each one of those teethers producing a head. And second, that that head is going to be as large as as the crop can handle at this point in time. So extremely important, Eric, uh, these uh, rains that we have had, both in giving the crop a chance to bounce back from the harsh winter temperatures that we have had, and also to incorporate the nitrogen and sulfur in the root zone now, giving the crop a chance to uptake that together with the water and really take on spring growth. When you look at that cumulatively, Romulo, is there a chance that many of our stands out there avoided taking a yield hit, even though we had these roller coaster conditions, as you described them? Well, I think so, at least from the cold temperatures that we had during the winter, Mm -hmm. right? The the fields that were emerging late November and December, they usually are going to have a hit in their yield potential simply because they are so late. Right, and so they're going to have less fall form of dealers, which are the most productive. Uh, they're going to be later in cycle as well, meaning that their heading and grain feeling are going to happen later in the year and more likely under heat stress. And so they naturally, the fields that didn't emerge until November, they naturally they're going to have a lower yield potential than those that emerged on time, say early October or even late September. There, that was established in the fall, but the rainfall that we had now definitely gives the crop a chance to at least bounce back and perhaps offset some of that yield loss that we had from the the, the late emergence in the fall. Now, we have been traveling around the state, Eric, these last couple of weeks with our own research plots, doing our own fertility work there. And what I have seen has been quite promising, starting down in the south central part of the state, where we have some plots there uh, around Hutchinson, Reno County area. Uh, we, We were not too concerned with the crop conditions in that region and south, just because they had received more precipitation, they had more soil moisture, and the temperatures were not as cold there than in the remaining of the state. But the crop is looking really good there and growing and developing quite well. We go north, we have plots both in the Republic County and Mitchell County. There's a big difference there if the crop was planted on time, so following another wheat crop or even a canola crop. Usually we were seeing four or five dealers per plant, very well developed, nice root system. On those plots that were planted after soybeans, there is still a large difference depending on planting date. Soybeans were harvested so early last summer that we had several fields be planted after soybeans early in October. And those are looking pretty decent, you know, uh, probably one or two or two or three tillers there uh, per plant, so in in a good shape. Now, if you look at those that were planted late October and into November, uh, they're just showing a single plant there or, or a single stem per plant. Perhaps the first dealer just now starting to develop. So again, lower yield potential, but it was very promising to see that it is greening up and it is starting to grow out of the winter despite uh, that late emergence and despite the cold temperatures that we had. 
Well, Romulo, given the generous moisture that we have received, we're not out of the woods yet. If it would dry off and stay dry for a while, there would still be questions about the performance of this crop, would there not? Yes, yes, there would. You know, definitely we, this, this moisture that we got now, it was extremely timely and extremely welcome as well. But it's important to remember that we were very dry going into the winter, mm -hmm. right? And there was not a whole lot of winter precipitation there to, to really moisten things up, with the exception of southeast Kansas uh, and, and parts of south-central Kansas. Those two parts of the state, south-central, southeast, they have been in better shape in terms of moisture from the beginning. But north-central, central, and, and western Kansas, we have been quite dry since the beginning of the season. And, you know, we have been receiving a good amount of moisture recently, but there was not a lot of moisture in the soil profile to start with. So it's important to keep in mind, it's definitely going to get us even some weeks here of, uh, of peace of mind, but definitely for a good yield performance, we might still need some rain later on, preferably during sometime during rain feeling there. And thankfully, we're not hearing any mention yet of a late freeze. So let's <laughs> cross our fingers that that does not materialize, Romulo. Definitely, yeah. So that's, uh, well, it's another of the risks of the wheat crop, right? right. We're, we might be in good shape now, but uh, there's always a risk of a late freeze. Now, looking at the development of the crop, again, overall, it was emerged uh, later than we're usually when the crop is emerged. And, and that delays the cycle a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, this lack of moisture until recently was also holding the crop back compared to historically. And Whenever we talk about our first hollow stem samples, we can touch on these. But it seems like the crop is, if not on average, is a little bit behind this year compared to where a normal year could be. And, and so that can also help us avoid some of those late spring freezes, right? Or at least not avoid it, but uh, avoid that that freeze happens when the crop is very susceptible to some of those freeze, like flowering, for example. You mentioned the first hollow stem. We want to talk about that important indicator of when to remove cattle from wheat pasture. And we'll do that next after this break, Romulo. With us is Romulo Lolato, Wheat Production Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We'll return with him in a moment here on Agriculture Today. When a thunderstorm approaches, follow these safety tips. Lightning, known as the underrated killer, usually strikes the tallest objects. So avoid standing beneath trees or other isolated tall objects. Take shelter in a sturdy building. Remember, if you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Help keep you and your family safe this severe weather season. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. As we're joined once more by wheat production specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Romulo Lodato. And as we continue on here, Romulo, we want to talk about the information that you and others have been maintaining for wheat producers' benefit on the first hollow stem stage of wheat development. And remind us of why that's important. Yeah, so Eric, that uh, that's important in a few different aspects, right? First, of course, it gives us an idea of how quick the crop is developing. But I guess more practically, the growers who are more interested in this information are those who are growing the crop for a dual purpose. And by that, I mean grazing the, the crop now during, well, late fall, during winter and early spring, and removing the cattle at first hollow stem so that they can harvest the grain later. So first hollow stem is important, Eric, because it's the point in time when if the growers have not removed the cattle by then, up to that point, the cattle is only grazing leaf. It's only grazing foliage. And so the yield decrease that we have from grazing is not too steep. Starting at first hollow stem is the point where the cattle starts to graze those developing wheat heads. Right. Remember that those heads are going up the stem during this point in time. And so that's when the cattle starts to graze those heads. And so we have very, very steep yield decreases. Actually, there's some research from Oklahoma State University that shows that for every day that uh, growers are grazing past the first hollow stem, we might be losing anywhere from one to five percent per day in our grain yield. Meaning that if your average yield is 50 bushels per acre, you might be losing up to two bushels per acre per day if you're grazing past first hollow stem. So a very steep decline in yield 
in response to grazing, best first hollow stem. So that's why we're measuring that, Eric, and we measured it in several commercial winter wheat varieties that we plant in Hutchinson. The reason we select that location is that it's kind of like the northern edge where most of the wheat is grown in Kansas, and so it's kind of like as late as it will get in terms of first hollow stem for a region that is still representative, right? And we go out there on a weekly basis, sometimes two times per week, and essentially we collect samples from 34 varieties specifically this year that have been planted sometime in mid-September at a high seeding rate to represent what dual-purpose producers are doing. And all of the fertility to those trials that were done pre-plant, just like simulating what a grower would do in a dual-purpose situation. And right now we are collecting about 40 stems per variety and splitting them and measuring. It's very simple. How much hollow stem do we have below that developing wheat head? And do we see any of those varieties at this point having attained that level, Romulo? Yes. So our uh, last measurement, so we had measurements early March, a couple of them, and then mid-March. So in our last measurement, which was March 16th, we had one variety that had already passed that mark of uh, 1.5 centimeters. That's about half an inch, right? We're looking for about half an inch of hollow stem under that developing head to tell us that it's time to remove cattle. So out of the 34 varieties, only one had reached as of March 16th. But several of them, I think with the exception of three or four varieties, had already started developing a little bit of, of hollow stem there. And once varieties start to develop that hollow stem, then it, it actually can grow quite quickly, depending on environmental conditions. And because we have moisture now, and if we have relatively warm temperatures, for sure we're going to see those first hollow stem developing really quickly. We're right on the brink of that for many of those varieties. You'd recommend that producers be looking at their own stands and gauge this for themselves, as well as track the information that you and your team are gathering that's online and for their use? Yeah, so our uh, our recommendation here is that growers use this data that we're collecting as a guideline, but really keeping in mind that first hollow stem development is going to be variety specific and field specific. So if you have the same variety planted in two different fields, they might be at very different growth stages as well, depending on planting date and many other factors, fertility and so on. So ideally, growers uh, who have cattle grazing their, their wheat crop, they should go to to their specific fields, and uh, preferably in a non-grazed area of the field, maybe just outside the fence or, or some area that has not been grazed, and sample that area and see if those plants are, if, if you can see about um, half an inch of hollow stem, you know, just sample those plants, s- split the stem uh, lengthwise with a pocket knife, and see if you have more or less half an inch of hollow stem underneath that developing head, then it's time to remove the cattle. So definitely use our data as a guideline. Check it on the K-State e-update website or even in our social media at KSU Wheat. But definitely make sure that you check your individual fields to make an uh, an informed decision. Very well. And that e-update site, by the way, at agronomy.ksu.edu or on social media, at KSU Wheat, as Romulo says. And one more thing here, Romulo, more information that you and others here at the university have pulled together. This is based at the Mesonet website out of K-State, and it's a growing degree day account for winter wheat. Tell us what you've developed here. Definitely. So this was actually a collaborative effort. Eric DeWolf from Plant Pathology has started sampling wheat growth stages across the state years ago. And I started sampling that as well for the last about five years or so. And then we teamed up with the Kansas Maisonette with uh, Mary Knapp and Chip Redmond for us to develop a tool that growers could use, right? We were getting several requests from growers on how can I estimate my development or stage of the wheat in my field or something along these lines, right? So these last couple of years, we actually had several requests of that. And so we teamed up with the Kansas Mesonet, and between the observations that we had, the field observations that we had from Kansas, we were able to back calculate how many growing degrees we needed for the crop to be at a certain growth stage, right? So for example, starting January 1st, that's when these calculations start, 
how many growing degree days do we need accumulated for the crop to reach jointing? How many do we need for the crop to reach boot stage and antithesis and, and so on, right? So we were able to develop these intervals and we are giving these intervals because there is variability out there in terms, for example, in a given region, say that that given region has accumulated 2,000 growing degree days, right, after January 1st. Because there's differences in planting dates, there's differences in varieties, there's, there are differences in cropping systems, right? That crop at 2,000 growing degree days can be anywhere from heading all the way to water we ripe in grain filling stage. So there is a range there that's important for us to account. And so we developed this growth model that tells us that based on how much temperature has accumulated, what's the range and growth stage that a crop might be at a given region of the state. And how you envision producers can utilize this information then, uh, and they can go about this in various ways, you say, Romulo. Yes, yes, definitely. I would say, you know, go online and explore the tool and let us know if there's anything that we don't have there now that you'd like to see, right? But right now, uh, that tool allows you, for example, to compare to previous years. So if you just want to say, okay, let's say that you that you live in uh, Wichita County, Western Kansas, you know, you can go into that station and see how this year compares to 2016, which was a year when the crop was actually pretty early, right? Or how does it compare to 2020, which was, was a year where in that part of the state, the crop was quite late. So you can really see how this year's crop compares in development to previous years and to the normal as well. You can calculate as well if you have, if you have a given date, right? Let's say that you look in the past and, and, and you don't remember, you, you, you know that the fungicide was applied at a given date, but you don't know what growth stage the crop was then. You just put the, the select the closest weather station, put the date the fungicide was applied, and it's going to give you an estimate of the growth stage the crop was at that location. And, so, and, and there are many other graphics that growers can develop directly in that website, in the Kansas Maisonette Wheat Growing Degree Days tool. So definitely I would suggest the growers go ahead and explore that, make sure that they can take the most out of it, and let us know. Let us know if there's anything that uh, you'd like to see there that is not currently available. It's a great resource, and wheat growers, by all means, take full advantage of it. It's the Wheat Growth Stage page at the Mesonet website out of K-State. The address to that is M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. This amongst the wealth of information on crop production and weather at that website. Mesonet dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. Anxious to see more producers take advantage of that, Romulo? We've covered a lot here. Thank you for joining us on today's broadcast, and we'll be talking again quite soon. Thank you, Eric. He's Romulo Lolato, Wheat Production Specialist with K-State Research and Extension, on this part of Agriculture Today. Now we'll break away for a few minutes. When we come back, a look at today's lead stories from the Agricultural News page. Also, K-State's Mike Brook with another edition of Milk Lines and K-State's Charlie Lee with the weekly wildlife management segment. All of that is still to come here on the K-State Radio Network. Please keep it right here. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned into Agriculture Today from Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, today, March the 23rd, is National Agriculture Day, celebrating agriculture. 
and providing an opportunity for those in the industry to share the importance of agriculture with a broader audience. Among others, many student-led agricultural organizations, 4-H, FFA, Agricultural Future of America, and others are sharing information on the critical role that agriculture plays in our culture and economy, an opportunity to learn how agriculture provides safe, abundant, and affordable food and fiber products, and to share the story of how agriculture plays an essential role in maintaining a strong economy and how food and fiber products are produced. So at the community level, the state level, or otherwise, we'd invite you to take note of and be supportive of National Agriculture Day activities on behalf of Kansas number one industry. Well, in its weekly crop progress report, the USDA tells us that the Kansas topsoil moisture supplies as of last Sunday were at 15% surplus, 68% adequate, and 17% short to very short. Subsoil moisture now up to 7% surplus, 64% adequate, and 29% short to very short. The condition of the winter wheat crop from the USDA rated this week at 45% good to excellent, 34% fair and 21% poor to very poor. As the Biden administration ramps up efforts to uh, consider climate improvements, the USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack said yesterday that the department will play a major role in building market opportunities for farmers. Exactly what the future looks like, he said during the AgriPulse Ag and Food Policy Summit, will depend on what the agency learns from farmers along the way. The use of funding through the Commodity Credit Corporation is taking center stage on climate in policy debates among members of Congress and USDA officials. Vilsack said the CCC may provide an opportunity to establish a carbon bank for farmers. The charter of the CCC speaks specifically to markets, stabilizing markets, and creating markets, said the secretary. Now, House Agriculture Committee ranking member Glenn Thompson of Pennsylvania said during that same summit that he and many other lawmakers are opposed to using the CCC as a carbon bank. Thompson said he doesn't believe the Secretary of Agriculture has the authority to do so. The concern there is using CCC funds to establish a carbon bank interfering with other USDA programs important to producers, says Thompson. Currently, CCC funds are capped at $30 billion. Thompson said that private carbon markets have experienced some success. And quoting him, I think they're at the start of what we're going to see some very exciting things. And I'd hate to see the federal government, as he put it, Bigfoot around in this new and growing market. Next up, this week's edition of Milk Lines. Awaiting with that, K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning the increase in soybean meal prices that we have been seeing, as well as maybe some things we need to be thinking about alfalfa hay. As we watch the soybean market continue to climb and stabilize and then decrease a little bit, we've also seen significant increases in the soybean meal prices on our dairy farms. And although we may use other sources of protein to feed our dairy cows, it's still tracking quite a bit with the soybean meal price. So even though we might be using something like canola meal, that also is increased in price. So there's something I want you to think about, particularly as we're moving into late in the hay marketing season and moving into uh, the uh, first cutting here probably just in a couple of months. Some things you ought to think about in terms of feeding your dairy cows. For several years now, we haven't really thought about this because soybean meal price was fairly stable and fairly low. And, you know, many times uh, in the last uh, year to two years, we've been buying soybean meal for under $300 a ton. However, now we're looking at soybean meal prices that are 400 to maybe $450 a ton. And that has a significant impact on the value of protein that we find in alfalfa hay or alfalfa silage. So some things to uh, think about here. As these uh, soybean meal prices have increased, if we use that as a basis for the value of protein that we find in alfalfa hay, that has made alfalfa hay worth more. You see, if we go from about $300 a ton for soybean meal up to $400 a ton for soybean meal. 
alfalfa hay that, say, has 23% crude protein, there's an increase of about $46 a ton in that alfalfa value just based on the amount of protein that's in there in relationship to its cost if you were buying that same protein as soybean meal. And, you know, as you go up to soybean meals of $450 a ton, that increases maybe to a, about $69 a ton increased value for that same alfalfa hay. So I think you need to sit down with your nutritionist and really consider what the value of alfalfa hay or silage might be in your dairy ration in regards to where we're currently at with soybean meal prices. I really don't think these soybean meal prices are going to slide much maybe from what they're at currently, so I think we're going to see this relationship be important for the at least the next six months, if not longer. So as I look at the alfalfa hay market today, many places in Kansas, good quality alfalfa hay is running 200 to $220 a ton. Some cases a little bit higher, but most of it Uh, or at least in most areas, it is running about that range. With the increase in value of the protein in that hay, it may be becoming a more important part of the ration that you're feeding to your dairy cows. Again, you need to sit down with your nutritionist and have this discussion. Another thing I'd like you to think about as we move into alfalfa harvest season, and many of you raise some of your own alfalfa, it's really, really important to think about the protein content and the timing of harvest. We know if we harvest just a little bit earlier in the pre-bud stage before we see any blooms, we have a higher percent crude protein in that forage. might be important to do that because it's worth a lot this year in terms of the amount of soybean meal that you might have to buy onto your farm to replace lower protein content in hay that was put up a little bit too late. So as you're thinking about harvest of your own acres, or as you're thinking about purchasing alfalfa hay, make sure you take into account this increased value that we have due to increases in the cost of crude protein if it's coming from soybean meal or other sources. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And we'll return shortly on Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This Agriculture Today closes out with another visit featuring Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, on another wildlife management topic here. Charlie, there are many causes for attempting to repel birds from certain areas. Feedlots, for example, have dealt with problems of this nature over the years at other locations, too. I'm going to look today at surface repellents against bird infestations. And, and there are several products out there that are designed for this purpose, right? Yes, there are several area repellents uh, out there to repel common pest birds. Some of those would include starlings house sparrows, pigeons, those would be non-native species that cause problems. And then the native birds would include Canada geese uh, and gull species. All seem to cause problems in various locations for folks. Those problems can be associated, as you mentioned, with feed consumption from competition with livestock feeds. Uh, It can be for um, humans at outdoor dining facilities. It's for buildings, uh, bridges, anywhere that fecal material may accumulate. There's some uh, potential weakening of structures because of the acidic nature of the, of the feces. There's also health reasons to kind of control these uh, droppings uh, and reduce some of the health risk associated with fecal accumulation. But generally, We've tried to repel birds from an area with various means for a long period of time. The physical repellents would include things like netting, owl models, or decoys of other birds, audible sound, like noises produced from propane cannons or bioacoustics or shell crackers or whistle bombs, noisemakers, if you will. And we've had chemical repellents. Some of those chemical repellents uh, include 
surface contact repellents. There's been two types of those that have been out on the market for quite some time. Those would be a tactile contact repellent. And then the other type of repellent would be where chemicals are absorbed through the bird's feet and cause physiological distress. This uh, particular product that was being reviewed in last winter in the Human Wildlife Interactions Journal was a product that is on the market, has a label called Air Repel. It is an anthroquinone uh, product. The mode of action of anthroquinone is not really uh, completely understood, although it's believed to cause some negative post-ingestive consequences or upset stomach digestive tract issues, if you will. It's been used for a long period of time. It was actually labeled or patented in 1943 as a bird repellent. It's distilled or found in tomatoes, considered to be a, a product that's fairly safe to use. Has some other repellent activities, been used to deter small rodents from consuming seeds. It's also been used in many locations for birds. This particular trial used the, the product to help with the starling problem. We've talked many times over the years about the problems with European starlings. I'm not sure there is a, a good solution yet, but one of the things we often try is a ways to repel them away from the area, although seldom have we had much success with area repellents. So how did they carry out this trial here, anthroquinone again being the base repellent? What did they arrange to test out its efficacy? Well, this was a cage study with about 50 starlings in each cage with two rows of five perches on each side of a array of feeding stations and a water station uh, within each small cage. Small cages were about a meter and a half by a meter in size, maybe as much as two cubic meters uh, of a volume. The perches were switched from one side to the other halfway through the trial, and they collected the amount of droppings under each perch to get an idea of the efficacy of the product. They set it up with three treatments, with a control or with an inert treatment, and then one product was anthroquinone with castor oil, and the commercial product, Air Repel, without the anthroquinone, but also included the castor oil. And then the other, the control was called MS2. It's a novel inert formulation with a tacky, oily texture. They compared each formulation directly to an untreated control. And you say they discovered that the repellents, well, they may not have any inherent advantage in starling control here. Yeah, they made the, the statement that both formulations that contain no anthroquinone worked equally well or better than the air repel uh, with the castor oil or the anthroquinone-based formulation. There are some benefits to that exclusively inert formulation that includes less risk to applicators or to non-target species. They tried to make some suggestions or perhaps uh, list ideas of why it was not effective. And I think although painting the perches with this product changed color and the tactile feel of those perches, they suggested that perhaps it was the tactile feel that's just as important as the chemical that's placed on those perches that was repelling birds. Boiling it down here, it sounds as if repellents might be considered at best a secondary deterrent compared to the other methods you mentioned earlier. Yeah, there's some uh, application here. Uh, the, we've had problems with repellents in the past in that they maybe become sticky, they may accumulate dust and, and then not be sticky for a very long period of time. Unlike most surface application repellents that accumulate dust and moisture and other debris, the commercial product air repel with castor oil and the air repel without the anthroquinone dried to the touch and did not accumulate debris. So a surface application repellent would be advantageous in the field, 
when it's compared to commercially available surface application treatments. Once more, quickly reviewing today a study on Starlink control using repellent products of this type and just how impactful that product can be in warding away starlings from a given area. Charlie, thanks for a look at this today. Former wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension, along with us. And with that, today's edition comes to a close. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.